station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, are you ready for the event? Houston, the International Space Station is ready for the event. CTV Studios, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Canada AM host Beverly Thompson. How do you hear me? Beverly and Canada AM, I hear you loud and clear. How do you hear me? I can hear you very well, Commander Hadfield. Thank you so much for doing this. I, it's a real pleasure. I, I've been lucky enough to visit with you folks several times and to be able to talk to you today from this place uh, doing these things is, uh, is a real privilege. Well, and it's, it's so great for us to be able to catch up with you. You know, we do a lot of interviews all over the world. This is our first, my first certainly doing one out of this world. I have to ask you to tell us kind of, you know, not where in the world you are, but literally, where are you in the International Space Station? The uh, International Space Station is enormous. I mean, it's a lot... Well, a lot bigger than most people think. It's a bunch of laboratories bolted together. I'm currently in one of those laboratories. Uh, that's the universe just out the window. We're inside the Japanese laboratory. Just behind the camera is the European laboratory. The American laboratory is over there. The Russian segment is down there. And then all across it here, bigger than uh, five hockey rinks, is the whole space station. It's, it's a big place. And we're just in one little corner of it here right now with experiments all around me. You know, and it's just, even though we know you're in weightlessness, it's still pretty funny to see a microphone just kind of sitting, floating around. I have to ask you, tell us how you spend your day, your average day there. Average day in space, uh, uh, you wake up at 6 a.m. Uh, we live on the Greenwich time. They, they had to kind of split the pain between mission control in Moscow and mission control in Houston. So they chose London, England, about halfway between. So we wake up at 6 a.m. Uh, London time. Uh, you have an hour and a half or so in the morning to get yourself ready, just like everybody does. Clean up, uh, go to the bathroom, which is a little intricate in space, make yourself some breakfast, read the day's plan. And then we have a, a meeting with all of the mission controls all around the world, uh, where we talk to each of them. There's one in Europe, there's one in Montreal, there's one in Houston, Moscow, and uh, Japan. And then once everyone's uh, told us the important stuff for the day, then we work our way through uh, experiments, fixing equipment, uh, maintaining the vehicle, all the various things you might do. Uh, a couple breaks for, for meals. It's evening time. Oh, during the day, we exercise two hours as well because uh, without fighting gravity, you could be really lazy. So uh, even my microphone floats, as you say. So, uh, so we exercise two hours a day, uh, have dinner, and, uh, and then you have about an hour and a half in the evening to try and catch up on personal things, maybe uh, look out the window, take some pictures, play a little guitar, talk to family and then go to bed, get to six or seven hours sleep, and repeat. And we pretty much do that every day for the whole six months we're here. And Commander, how are you feeling now that you've been up there as long as you have already and you've got, you know, the rest of your time there for your six months? How do you physically feel now? I, I completely feel adapted. I feel like a spaceling. I, it sounds weird. It's not a very common word, but I don't feel like an Earthling. I mean, I can, I can fly and float and and turn upside down. I I don't need to touch the floor. It's it's a whole new uh, way to be. And at first, it feels very strange. But now you don't even think about it. You're just if you want to put something somewhere, you just let go of it, and and uh, you become graceful and elegant in weightlessness, maybe like a, 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 a porpoise in the water or, or a, a swallow in the air. And at first you're clumsy, you bump into things, but after a while it really feels natural. In fact, it, it's a big improvement on gravity. Uh, nothing sags on your body, so, uh, so it's gratifying when you're in your 50s. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to be, to be able to fly and float and, uh, and take advantage of this really rare experience. And that's just the physical side of things. There's so many interesting things that you've been sharing with us, not the least of which we saw you making a peanut butter sandwich. Tell me about some of the, uh, not the dangers, but some of the, the troubles or some of the things you have to be careful about with regard to eating. 
you know, try eating a lunch sometime where you lie on your back and you make your whole lunch uh, holding the food up in front of you, above you. You know, opening up a can, opening up anything, trying to use utensils where you can't set anything down and everything that you open, there's nothing to keep it in the container. That's sort of what it's like. I just brought uh, a can of uh, typical food that we eat here. This is... Um, this is a white bean puree, and it's, uh, you know, it's got a pull top, but of course, if it's a liquid inside, as soon as you open this, you're going to have a big ball of white bean puree floating around, so hopefully the manufacturer has thought to make everything sticky in there, and, and uh, your, your fork, if you turn around, your spoon is gone. Uh, we can't really heat our food very well. Everything just comes like this, pre-made pre and pre-packaged, so we just have sort of a little... Uh, you know, easy bake oven that we warm things up in. Uh, there's no real chiller for the water. So the food isn't really cold, and you can't make anything fresh, of course, because it's like being on a long voyage anywhere, a long sailing voyage where everything has to have a long shelf life. But uh, we have dietitians and uh, health specialists on Earth in, in Montreal with the Canadian Space Agency and at NASA and in Russia, and they really take good care of us. There's a big variety of food. It tastes good, and it's keeping us healthy. So even though it's a little tricky eating up here, as you saw in the peanut butter video, um, it's, uh, it, it's quite pleasant. It's something we look forward to, both uh, just for the food, but also as a social get-together. There's so much that is so fascinating about this mission, and you've been able to share all of it with us through social media, through taking pictures. Just yesterday, we saw a picture of that you took of Mount Etna. Some of these images are just stunning. I, I don't know how you have time to do it, but you do do it. You've got so many followers. Tell me when you first saw this picture of Etna and you took it, what you thought. Well, I get tremendous support from the ground. The Canadian Space Agency has a team of people that have been working on this flight for a couple of years, and they're doing a, a great job. Um, my children as well, especially my son Evan, has been uh, helping me, uh, an old guy like me, understand social media. And be with that whole team, uh, uh, we've really had a chance to include a lot of people in this. And so they send me information. I, I got a note saying that Mount Etna was erupting. And uh, and then the people at NASA also said, hey, here's a particular pass where the lighting might be good. And so I set the, the alarm on my watch here and, um, and uh, went over to the window at the right time and grabbed the camera and tried to take some pictures. And and it's, Beverly, it's, it's sort of like almost a miracle when you're working away in what looks sort of like a building and you float over to the window, like that one there, and uh, and you look outside, and, and you're transported. It's uh, you suddenly there's the whole world in all of its curvature in front of you, and there's a volcano out of the world that is spewing ash and smoke and steam, and and uh, you float the big lens up in front of you and zoom in on it, and you can see how the, the energy from that volcano, from this great big earth that we live on, is, is spewing the energy of the earth up into the high atmosphere where it's being picked up by the jet stream and carried out over the Mediterranean. And we're going eight kilometers a second. So we come up, you start getting your camera ready over Africa, and, and you come across the horizon, and there's Mount Etna, and you take pictures as it rolls by in front of you, and then the next thing you know, you're over the Black Sea and, and up and over Kazakhstan and gone. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's phenomenal. And as you say, I'm working all day on all the science we're doing here, but at the same time, the, the distraction of, of what's out these windows and the, uh, the lure of the magnificence of our own planet is a magnet that, that constantly pulls you away. And it's such a lure for everybody on, here on Earth, and we've been watching with interest. You've been speaking to so many students and classes. They ask you great questions. It must be wonderful for you to be able to share and see the excitement that these kids share in your mission. Yeah, when I was a kid growing up, it was the very start of space exploration back in the 60s and early 70s. And I was fascinated by it. I thought of all the things that are going on with our species and our history right now, this is something really new in the human experience to, to be leaving our planet. And so I was really excited about it as a kid. And whenever somebody's taught me, I've always sort of felt that, well, now I, I, I have an obligation to try and share the privilege of things that I've learned with, with other young people, uh, same as people did with me when I was little. And so I really, over the last 20 years as an astronaut, uh, have spoken right across Canada and up in the Arctic and um, 
trying to let people know the opportunities that are there. Uh, this is something that Canadians do. There's Canadian hardware on here. The Canadarm built this place. It's just in the outside. There's a Canadian science experiment looking at how um, uh, tiny nanoparticles react, doing fundamental research right over here behind me. And all of this is going on. It's an opportunity for Canadians, Canadian universities, Canadian businesses. And so I'm the lucky guy who gets to be here. But I really consider it a, a vital part of my job not to keep this experience to myself, but to use every means that I can think of to try and share it, to try and let people see what we're doing up here and the fact that we are starting to leave our planet permanently for the first time in history. It's a pretty interesting stage. And uh, now with the technology that's available to be able to immediately share a picture of Mount Etna or, or some random thought or some emotion that's going through uh, it really even makes it more accessible and for me more rewarding to be able to not just keep it to myself but to be able to let people right across Canada share it. And I guess we can add Canadian music to that because of your song and the, and the Bare Naked Ladies and the fact that students are going to be singing this song, your song, on Music Monday. What do you think of that? I think it's tremendous. I, I went through, the, uh, of course, the Canadian school system. I had music teachers in elementary school and high school. Miss Soren, who taught me in, uh, in high school, taught me how to read music and how to play musical instruments. Um, and when we looked at this Coalition for Music Education right across Canada, they have a great program with Canadian schools. And, um, and we thought, why not participate in that? Invited Ed Robertson, who I'd known for years. The two of us wrote a song together, joined with the choir, the, the Gleeks from Wexford, and, and sang this song. And it really came off nicely. It, it's a song about exploration, about starting to leave the earth, about putting all that into personal perspective and what it means to us. And uh, Ed and I really liked the song that we wrote. And it's going to be uh, sung by schools. I, I mean, I invite all Canadians to listen to this song. It's, you can see it through the Canadian Space Agency website and through Music Mondays and Coalition for Music Education. Um, and it's going to be in schools across Canada on the first Monday in May, Music Mondays. I think it's the 6th of May. Um, a song called uh, Somebody Singing, ISS, International Space Station. And for me, um, Music is, is fundamental to humanity. Uh, they've found musical instruments in, w when we lived in caves 40,000 years ago. Of the few artifacts, the things that people made, they made musical instruments back then, before written history. It, it's an ancient necessity for humanity. And to be able to uh, have a guitar up here, to be able to write and play music up here, to be able to then share it and have Canadians join in voice and song uh, is just another wonderful way to try and help communicate not just the science, which is important, but also the art and the humanity of this experience. And, uh, and I really hope lots of Canadians will, will have a chance to, uh, to join in in the music. Why not? It's, just, it's really great to see you holding that guitar. And, and with the weightlessness, when you play that guitar, does that feel different? Oh, it sure does. It's uh, the guitar, just kind of like this microphone. The guitar just floats in front of you, so you don't need a strap. But it is a little weird to fret up the neck because because uh, your arm doesn't weigh anything. So so you kind of have to uh, pay a little more attention when you're when you're playing up and down the neck. You need to uh, you need to really think about where your hand's going. But fortunately, there's a Canadian guitar on board, made out in Vancouver, and uh, that was just a lucky coincidence to have a Canadian on board with a Canadian guitar. And I've, in my spare time, I've been playing lots of Canadian folk songs, Stan Rogers and Gordon Lightfoot and, and uh, M. Griner and a bunch of music and, and, uh, and having a chance to play some songs that I've been writing and record uh, music. It's just, you know, it's, it's not the main purpose of what we're here for, but uh, having that as something to do in my spare time is, uh, is something I do on Earth and, and it's a wonderful facet of, the, uh, of actually living in space. Yeah, I just love it. And, you know, given the, the, the amount of space that you have for personal, what other kinds of personal things did you bring with you? I mean, obviously you've got a guitar. What other kinds of things were important to you to have with you? 
Well, I looked at this, uh, of course, as, as sort of a very significant event within my life, within my family, my extended family's life. And so I invited, of course, each of my family members, brothers, sisters, children, my wife and, and parents, of course, and asked them if, if they would like me to bring something up for them. And we're very, very space limited. I came up and I helped. In fact, I was like the pilot of the Soyuz, the Russian rocket ship, spaceship that we flew up here. So in fact, everything I could bring had to fit in a package about as big as a, one of those little loaves of bread and couldn't weigh more than a kilo and a half. So just small things. But almost everybody has some small little, maybe something that's historic to them or personal to them or important. And so I collected those from all my family, little you know, jewelry or, or uh, maybe something from a grandparent, something that's been passed down through the generations, little things like that. My brother wrote a song you know, that, uh, that I brought up, the sheet music for, that type of stuff. And, and now I have that up here. And it's really nice actually to go through them one by one. Of course, I want to photograph with them, but to take them out and think about uh, uh, this is the embodiment of, of a friend or, or a history or a whole story, each one of them, and to float it weightless next to myself, snap the camera with the world in the background, uh, not just knowing that this is an interesting photograph, but this is an encapsulation of, of humanity and time, looking at it, putting it back in the package and taking out another one. It's, uh, it's a personal but, but a, a really a touching moment for me and, and a real joining moment with everybody that's important to me. Wow, and you know, you're so busy up there with the experiments that you've mentioned, and such a full day, you are about to take over command of the International Space Station. Are you still going to have time to do your tweets and your photographs and all of that that we love? Uh, you just can't deny it. And, I mean, I could sleep longer, I guess, but <laughs> that, that would be a waste. Uh, I mean, we have a very regimented life. We, in fact, have a schedule on a computer that moves in one-minute increment. Our life is scheduled to five-minute increments for the whole five months. But there's a little bit of gray space at the start of the day and the end of the day. And, and there's also a block where you're supposed to be asleep. And, and yes, I, I do. I take over to command what is, in effect, the world spaceship uh, here in, in a couple weeks, uh, which is just amazing uh, for me to even contemplate that. I can accept the reality of it, but but in my heart, it just still is uh, is kind of uh, daunting and and, and uh, surreal. But uh, I'm definitely need to address that role. Uh, of course, my regular working day here, but at the same time, I'm not going to spend my evenings and spare time, you know, watching movies or. Um, or not being productive. That's not what people put me here for. It's definitely not what I want to do. And I'm in such a rare position on behalf of so many Canadians, so many of my coworkers, so many people that I want to live this experience just as fully as I can, share it with Earth real time, but also absorb it as completely as I can so that I can reflect it back and reflect on it and, and let people know what it means to all of us uh, you know, for the rest of my life. So yeah, I'll be busy, but uh, this is a good place to be busy. I know there's a go going to be a lot of things you're going to want to do, not the least of which is hug your family when you get back, but what would you look forward to being able to do once you're back on Earth? It's a very um, quiet, uh, austere environment here. Uh, great people, super competent, undemanding, uh, self-starting group of six humans that I'm up here with from all around the world. Uh, it's interesting, we grew up speaking different languages, very different cultures, people from uh, Belarus and Russia and uh, different places in the United States and me from Canada. Um, and yet, this little microcosm, we have a, a wonderful time working here, but it's also, you know, it's somewhat um, monastic, and I'm very much looking forward just to the contact of being back on Earth, the, the noise and the tumult and the wind in your face and being able to give someone a hug and, and uh, just the regular messiness of life. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to, uh, of course, we have all the compulsory things, but to relaxing, to getting back to our cottage in Canada and spending the time with my, uh, with my feet up, trying to uh, put all this together and figure out, you know, what it really means and, and uh, somehow fit it into the rest of my life and, and uh, try and really put it into context of, of everything else that's going on. So I think the debriefs, the rush of humanity, and then a chance to really reflect on it. There, there's all the 
trivial stuff of you know food that I want to eat or something but but in truth it's the opportunity to to really make the most of it that, that I'm looking forward to when the pace slows again. Commander Hadfield, this has been such an incredible opportunity to speak with you. You've been such an inspiration, continue to be. Best of luck and uh, safe travels for the rest of your mission. Thank you. For the rest of your mission, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's been a real pleasure to talk with you. Thanks for having me on. Bye. The station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Station, thank you. This is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, CTB Studios. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.